Last Sunday we wrapped up chapter 10 and closed out the fourth major theme of the epistle, carnal liberty. I feel like we were in that subject for a long time, and that's because we were. Uh, but we closed that out, and then this morning we'll begin the fifth, and I'm saying the final major theme, which is carnal worship. Originally I said there was probably going to be about seven major themes, but as we've been moving through the book, the flow of the letter, the flow of the book has become clearer to me, and it looks like what I saw as two additional themes are just absorbed into this one. So it makes more sense just that this theme of carnal worship, it just carries through to the end of the book. That's what makes the most sense to me. So this will be the last one, and of course this makes it the longest of the five because it covers six basically six full chapters. So this is a subject that Paul really devotes a lot of parchment and pen to, carnal worship. Six full chapters. And, you know, when I began to realize that, as I was looking at it early on last week, I thought, why did he devote so much ink and papyrus or parchment to this subject of carnal worship? Well, I think it's because... Um, and it, it's, just, it's just my thought as, as we've been moving through the book, but I think it's because the Corinthians were probably most confused and most, mostly curious about this particular subject of worship than the others. We've dealt with sexuality, we've dealt with all kinds of things, and they were perplexed about a great many themes and subjects, but I think this is the one that, you know, when, when it came to just gathering together and, and for how to serve the Lord and what that would look like, it, it seems to me that this is the one that they really needed some clarity on. And as we move through the rest of the epistle, we will see, yeah, no doubt, because they weren't doing communion right. There's a lot of things that they just weren't doing right. So I think there's so much ink, so much papyrus devoted to this because this is the, this is the kind of the cardinal top subject for them. They were very, very confused. And we know from chapter 7, verse 1, that they sent a letter to Paul asking a lot of questions. And his response was to give pastoral answers. And one of those questions had to do with worship, like, how should we be doing this? How should we be doing that? Um, they wanted clarity on what I see to be at least five worship subjects. Um, questions I think they were asking because of we see these subjects throughout the rest of the epistle. One would be, how does headship and submission work in the church? You know, who, who's, who's to be leading the churches? Who's to be leading the worship gatherings? Who's to be praying and prophesying? What's the posture during that? I mean, they were really trying to figure out, and they were confused about that. But really, it's about headship. But what, what do we have... Is there a biblical patriarchy, you know, and we don't want to think in terms of worldly patriarchy, but is there a, is there a headship model in Scripture? Do men lead? Do women lead? This is something they were asking. Another thing they were asking is um, how should we conduct the sacraments, especially communion? Um, I think there was probably somebody in the church that watched communion play out in the church during the weekends or whenever it I don't think this is how it should be done. Fred's drunk over there, and this guy's hungry because he didn't get any of the elements. There was an observation made, and they were confused about communion. Another thing they were asking is, how should we serve each other with our spiritual gifts? I mean, Paul, you have taught us that we all have spiritual gifts. How should those play out in the church? How should we be utilizing those things? And one thing that they were really focused on and getting wrong was they thought that some gifts were greater than others. And, and you, know, you know that that's what he deals with like in chapter 13 where he's talking about tongues and prophecy and love. And so we have these gifts. How do we, what does biblical, what does scriptural service look like they were asking? Fourthly, they were asking, which is probably one of the more bizarre things, you know, your polity on how you carry out a worship service, that's one thing, but they were also confused about doctrine or statutes. You know, they were asking what statutes, what doctrines should we believe? If you can believe this, some were confused about the resurrection of Christ. Is that a primary doctrine? Is it a tertiary or secondary doctrine? 
Um, we know that he unfolds that subject in unbelievable detail in chapter 15. Why? Because they were very confused about it. What about our own resurrection? You've even said that we will be resurrected at the return of Christ. Is that really going to happen? Is that a reality? It doesn't feel like a reality. I think all of us in this room would say at times, yeah, that doesn't seem like much of a reality. I guess I'll be stuck in this terrible earth suit. So they were confused about resurrection. They didn't understand that. And then fifthly, they were curious about giving, in particular sacrificial giving. Paul was going around to churches gathering a collection for the most impoverished church of all, and that was in Jerusalem. You would think in Jerusalem that would have been the wealthiest church, but it was the poorest of all of them. The Gentile churches were far wealthier in terms of monetary and money. But there's a collection going on. But really what Paul deals with, like in chapter 16, is just scriptural, you know, scriptural giving, scriptural generosity, scriptural sacrifice. So they, they were wondering, what does sacrificial giving look like? Uh, how, what does it look like? How, sh how much should we give to the church? And how frequently should we give to the church? These are all questions. Because he gives answers in the rest of the epistle to all these questions, I believe these questions were obviously in their letter to him. Paul was determined to stop their confusion. To, he was determined to satisfy their curiosity by applying scripture to all of these worship subjects. And his answers to their questions and to these subjects, that is the main body of teaching in the rest of the epistle. That's what, these are the things that we'll be looking at. Of course, he goes into a lot of detail. And this morning, we're going to focus on just the very first part of the first worship subject and the, you know, initial response from Paul. This will be a, a five-point sermon with a total of five easy-to-remember C's. We'll just cover three today, Lord willing, and two next week because I had every intention of doing all five today. But when I got to page eight, I was like, I'm done. So we'll pick it up next week. I think it's befitting that we should pray once more before we get to work. Lord, thank you for everything that you've graced us with so far, especially today, singing your word and fellowshipping in your word and uh, an amazing little study that's going on before the service. And just, you're just so good to us, Lord. I pray that we would respond to all your good grace, all your graces, all your mercy with just obedience, Lord, coming from our hearts and a generosity coming from our hearts. Lord, teach us this morning about this first part. We need to learn about scriptural submission. That's really what we're dealing with today and next week, as I said, Lord willing, um, help us to understand what the scripture teaches about headship and submission. And so be glorified during this time. We love you so much and pray in Christ's name. Amen. Take your Bibles and turn over to 1 Corinthians. We're now in chapter 11. We're going to focus on verses 2 to 5 today. And I'd like to just pick up where we left off. We've prayed. I want to pick up where we left off last Sunday and look at our first point in chapter 11. It's the first C. The first thing we see is Paul's commendation. Commendation. We see this in verse 2. It's really amazing what Paul does here. He's got a whole list of answers that starts here and goes all the way through to the end of the book. And he starts by commending the Corinthians, which is, I think, really cool, especially to us because we've been studying the book and he really hasn't been commending them. <laughs> He's been commending and hammering and obliterating them because of their behavior. So, this, new, this next whole section begins with this really encouraging word from him. He says in verse 2, now I commend you, okay, I applaud you, right, is what he's saying, because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you. What an amazing statement to make to such a wayward church. I think the one thing that set this church apart from a great many churches then and today 
is that no matter how wayward and sinful and backslidden it had become at times, it seemed to always know and understand who to go to for answers in the midst of their confusion. Right? Isn't that astounding? You would think that a church this sinful would just not even reach out to Paul, not even ask, it would just do whatever it thinks is right according to its own heart. Like in the book of Judges, with it, it, you know, it opens with this whole idea of the, you know, the people really didn't know the Lord and they did what they thought was right. And then if you read the rest of the book of Judges, you find out that the human heart is corrupt above all else because they just kept making one mistake after the other and giving themselves over to idols. I think it's astounding that no matter how sinful this church seemed to be and was, that Paul is saying, you have this resiliency about you. You have this ability, no matter what, to come to the source, to quench your confusion. And let me tell you something right now. That in and of itself is not just a grace. That's a saving grace. That's a sign of true salvation, right? Because we know that for those who aren't truly saved, even though we might think that they are, what happens with people who have not been regenerated, who are not truly saved, is that when there's trouble, when there's confusion, they don't go to a divine source. They don't go to God for help. They don't go to godly people for help. They disappear. They leave the church, which proves to us that they were never real, right? John says, if they go out from us, then we know that they didn't actually belong to us. And so one of the things that separates the true believer from the false believer is this resiliency, This ability to go to the word for answers, this ability to go to godly counsel for answers, not just to throw your hands up and give up. And so this is a a sign or a mark of true salvation. And, And he is just totally commending them for it. In the midst of all this trouble, you have this ability to remember me in all things. Not like they sit there and go, oh, we better remember Paul. I mean, they just remember that we're confused. What what are we doing here spinning our wheels? Let's go to the apostle. Let's go to the godly man. Let's go to the founder of this church. I mean, obviously the spirit founded it, but you know what I mean. He's the human instrument. That shows that there's something really going on here, and Paul commends them for it. I love that. I do. And it gives me... It encourages me. Sometimes I miss the mark and and I I don't know what to do and I try to act in my own strength. But I know that at the end of the day, I always end up back at God's word or back at God's counselors and trying to figure out what to do. And that, that it, it, it encourages me because it's a sign of salvation. They go for the help. Uh, when, when real Christians find themselves in the midst of a cultural and or theological quandary, they go to trustworthy sources for answers, first and foremost, always scripture, then obviously to prayer, and then they go to what I prefer is the writings of old dead guys. Right? You just start reading Calvin and Spurgeon and these sorts of guys. They're really helpful. You obviously, the true Christian goes to real godly counselors. They go to Dave and, and Cameron and Sometimes me, not as frequently (laughs) because Carla knows what I mean. Uh, But, you know, because I just got that edge, you know, but uh, they just, they get the help, man. They go to Bruce. They still got, Bruce is retired from the elder board. More elder work than any of us, right? He's like an eternal elder. Peter will go to him for advice when when he's with the Lord in glory. Peter will go, what do you think I should do about this? Well, first of all, you have to start by saying, hey, brother. Peter will be like, hi, brother. It's just not natural. Hey, sister. So this, this, yeah, it's, I'm getting off track here. That's, that's what the true believer does. And there's something else that he commends them for. It's not just their resiliency and ability to come back to the person they trust for theological advice or whatever. Paul commends them equally for maintaining the traditions that he had delivered to them right? He says that. I I gave you traditions when I was out there and planted this church, and these are good biblical traditions, and you have this ability to try to carry those things out and try to live those things out. And um, the Greek word for tradition is paradosis, and it really means something that has been passed along through teaching. 
So the idea here is some kind of a biblical tradition, something that would be affirmed by Scripture. It could have been a model for when they gathered to worship that they had forgotten about over time with all the influences around them. Who knows? But he's commending them for kind of upholding traditions. And the thought here is not man-made traditions that are unnecessary. It's something that has substance to it. In Matthew 15, 2 to 6, Galatians 1, 14, and Colossians 2, 8, this word paradosis is used negatively to refer to man-made traditions, things that are just utterly useless. But in our text, and in 2 Corinthians 2, 15, it's used in a positive way to refer to divinely inspired traditions or scriptural traditions. Um, People tend to hate the idea of religion and traditions, but the scriptures are full of good, godly, biblical traditions. One of those traditions is what we're doing right now by gathering on the Sabbath day, Sunday. So traditions can be detrimental and they can be really good. If they're f- grounded in scripture, they're wonderful. Paul is commending the Corinthians for coming to him, remembering him in all things, and maintaining the scriptural traditions he had passed to them And right now at this point, he's anticipating that they will maintain the one that he's about to unpack for them. He's about to give them another kind of scriptural set of traditions, one that deals in particular with submission and headship. So that's the the first see his commendation. He hooks them up right off the bat. And number two, our next see, is Paul's clarification. We see this in verse 3. He says this next, and he says, but, and sometimes when that word appears in the Bible, it's like, oh no, you're commending us, but, <laughs> right? There's, there's a contingent, or there's a, there's a stipulation here on this. So he says, but I want you to understand something here, that the head of every man is Christ, that the head of a wife is her husband, and that the head of Christ is God. So this Seems like such a bizarre thing to say right after commending them for upholding traditions and coming to him as a source. But I think what we can see clearly now is the subject that the Corinthians were ultimately confused with here, and that has to do with headship and submission. This is something that they didn't quite understand right here. In the Greco-Roman society, which is what they lived in, women lived in the background, unfortunately. They were really more or less exploited or used for things rather than being treated with dignity and respect and honor as image bearers or anything like that. And one of the things that really, really sickens me is that in in this culture, in this first century, in that society, one of the things that women were known for best was prostitution, which is just... It's just sick. It's just so sad. And um, so there was a very, very low view of women in Greco-Roman society. They were like, hey, they can give you a kid or they, they're prostitutes. I mean, they, it was just bad. It was horrible. Not God's design by any means. But, however, the gospel, I mean, Christ through the gospel did give women dignity, did give them honor, right? I mean, clearly, Jesus, uh, uh, through his ministry and teaching and even surrounding himself with godly, faithful women, really changed the way that the world saw women beginning then. And unfortunately, it's gone back and forth, but he really gave women dignity and honor and cherished them the way that they should be cherished, especially as image bearers. But because of how he liberated women, sometimes women went too far with that liberation, right? To to be honored and valued equally to men was the goal, but not to take women and to exalt them above men or to turn them into... feminists or anything like that. So, so Christ comes to liberate, but we tend to take the good things of God and misuse them. And that was happening with a great many gals, in, even in the church. They had mistaken Christ's restoration for them in value to some kind of superior level or some kind of out-of-control level, like we see today. 
Um, the Corinthian church, it was witnessing a kind of rebellion by women in the church. As I said, like they were, they were taking it too far. They were going too far, especially during worship gatherings. Like they would show up for church and they, they would go beyond where they were to be. And this is, I'm not picking on women. Women is the focus in the text. So I'm only trying to give you a good commentary on it here. And what was happening is they were just going too far with their liberties, too far with their liberation, abusing it. And they, they were attempting in some ways, and some of the guys were too, but they were attempting to switch roles with the men and to swap headship and to take over and take control of the churches and these sorts of things. And in many cases, guys let it happen. The men, godly men were like, well, I, you know, it says in a proverb somewhere, there's nothing worse than a wife scorned. So go ahead, honey, you're the new pastor. They were kind of kowtowing and, and kind of getting out of the way. And, and so in the letter, some were asking, should Christian women act in a way that is contrary to the traditions that we have? And when they were asking that question, they weren't saying women should be down here under our feet. They were saying, hey, Christ liberated women and we're equals and we have roles and headship. They're asking, should women be doing this kind of rebellion? Is this what they should be doing? They were asking, should they be acting like the pagans around us that we're trying to reach? Christian women. Should, is it okay? I mean, is, is, you know, they're asking, is the, is the church, are we moving in a new direction here? Is this, is this, the, is this the spiritual flow of the church where, where we're, we're putting women in pastorates and in elderships and, and they're starting to teach or they're, you know, they're doing this? They're asking these questions. Is it okay? What we're seeing is that women are disregarding their headship and submission, especially to their husbands and pastors. We're seeing that. Is that normal? Is that the direction we're going in? Of course, if you asked that question today, rather than the first century, you asked it in the 21st or whatever we're in now, people would say, of course, that's the direction we're going in. There's women pastors everywhere and everything else. But they're asking this question in the first century. Solomon is right. There's nothing new under the sun. Right? As long as there's been the fall and there's been a devil and sinners in the world, they're asking, is this the direction the body of Christ is taking? We're seeing women do things they've never done before. Is this right? And what Paul does, knowing that this is their struggle, what is he doing in verse 3? He's clarifying the order of headship. He's addressing it firstly by laying out proper biblical scriptural headship and submission. Makes total sense, right? He's saying what he's saying in verse 3 because there is a problem with headship and submission in this church. And first he says that the head of every man is Christ. Okay, that, that's, that means that Above man, there is Christ. You've got Christ, and then in the order of headship, you've got Christ, and then you've got men, males, not man universally, males. That's what he opens with. Now, we know that Christ is uniquely the head of the church as its Savior and Lord, Ephesians 1, and 23, and Ephesians 4, 15, Colossians 118. We know this, that he's the head of the church. He redeemed and bought it with his own precious blood, 1 Corinthians 8 or 6.20 and 1 Peter 1, 18 to 19, of course, over in Revelation 5, 9. But what Paul's actually saying here is that his divine authority extends way beyond the church to literally every man, not just Christian men. He's actually the head of all men, all males, and all humanity for that matter is what he's saying here. So in the order of headship, you have Christ, and then you have man in particular, and then you have humanity, all of humanity. That's, that's the order. Right? He, his divine authority extends well beyond the church to every man, every literal human being, believer and unbeliever alike. 
He is the king, and a king rules over all. Nobody is outside of his kingship. When are we going to start to understand this? We just sang two songs about it. The Lord Almighty reigns. That is the best news you will ever hear. He reigns. I mean, you know, he, he did himself say all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Matthew 28, 18. I wonder if he meant that part of it was left out. Like women. Like some men. Like unbelievers. Like an octopus. Or a seahorse. Is there anything outside of it? A distant star? No. It's all under him. What he means when he says that all authority has been given to him, he meant that he is the head or authority over everything and everyone in all creation. And we know that most of mankind has never and likely never will acknowledge or submit to his authority. Not now in the mode that we're in, but that doesn't mean that all things have not somehow been put in subjection to his feet. He, everything has been put in subjection under his feet. Everything. Hebrews 2.8, and one day when he returns to consummate his kingdom, what's going to happen? Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is kind of Lord, that he's Lord to the glory of the Father, Philippians 2.10 to 11. And I think that we know that those who willingly submit to his authority, obviously, those are Christians. Those who do that, that constitutes the church. And those who rebel against his authority constitutes the world. But he's still king overall. Not everyone in a king's kingdom wants to submit to him, but he's still the king and it's still his kingdom. Just because somebody's not submitting doesn't mean they're outside of his rule So, firstly, Christ is head. He's at the top. There's nobody above him. Well, the Father in this order of things, but we know they're co-eternal, co-equal, but we'll get to that. Christ is the head of man. Second, Paul says, the head of a wife is her husband. Okay, this is where the wives start to go. I don't like the direction of this. Translation from Greek to English, I don't like scripture. That's what it says. Okay? The head of a wife is her husband. And, and understand this too, as Christ is the head of believing men, he's also the head of all men in a sense, and that applies here as well. The subject of headship applies to all men and women not just believing men and women and not just husbands and wives. In the created order, you have Christ and you have males. We're not talking about Christian here. Christian, yes, but we're talking about in the created order itself, which transcends just whether a person's believer or not. It extends beyond the family to all aspects of society. Man, as the head, is the basic order of creation, right? He's the head under Christ. And Paul explains this in much more detail in verses 8 and 9, but we got to wait to get there. This is the way God planned and created humanity. Christ as creator and head, males or men right under him, and then under that, women. It's the way he did it. And he'll, he'll blow that subject out in verses 8 and 9. Modern or postmodern society, I don't know what form we're in right now. How about just depravity? It really despises this reality, right? Are we not seeing that today in, in vivid color? It's not only hell-bent on destroying gender roles, but now it's hell-bent on destroying gender itself. At first, it was just about putting women above men or whatever, or having men ruling over women in some ungodly fashion. Uh, but now, culture is just determined to just blur and destroy gender altogether. Not just roles, but what is a man? 
It's a woman who looks like a man. What is a woman? It's a man who thinks he's a woman. I just, it's nuts. And most of this is coming to us through what I would call woke transsexualism. It's what it is. And sadly, most of these cultural, societal fads and blatant, just ridiculous misconceptions that we find in the world, they sometimes eventually find their ways into the church. Worldly Christians are, you know, continually trying to find ways to justify their worldliness, and if possible, they'll even use Scripture as the basis for this. Christian feminists appeal to such passages as Galatians 3.28 and usually 1 Peter 3.7 to disprove the idea that husbands are to have headship over their wives and that wives should be submissive to their husbands. I mean, they, Christian women have been attacking this for a long time. They claim that in those particular passages, with the exception of 1 Peter, because that was written by Peter, but like in Galatians and here in Corinthians, that what Paul was doing was, you know, yeah, he's an apostle, he's a good guy, he's a Christian brother, but what he's really doing is giving his opinion at this point and not actual scripture. And whenever we find his opinions in his epistles, those can be disregarded and we don't have to worry about his chauvinistic opinions, but, well, okay. There's three warnings in Scripture, one in Deuteronomy, one in Proverbs, one in Revelation that says, do not add or subtract from the word or receive the curses of the book. That's all you're doing here. This is not opinion. This is truth. It's not chauvinistic prejudices. It's Scripture. It's the created order. If Christians would actually take the time to carefully read Paul's epistles, they would find that Paul makes no distinction between men and women as far as personal worth or abilities or intellect or, spiritually or spirituality or any of these things are concerned. There's no distinction there at all. They're completely equal in all of his writings. You can sense that. You can read that. Both as human beings and as Christians, women in general are completely equal to men spiritually. I think that if they were to actually read Paul instead of reading it with their presuppositions and desire to further liberate women or whatever their motive is, I think they would also find that Paul actually knew a great many women and ministered with some women who possessed some really incredible abilities, insane intellect, a very high level of spiritual maturity. Um, he did. He had. He knew women who were just incredible. Phoebe, Prisca or Priscilla, remember the wife of Aquila? These people were insane. Junia is another one. I mean, at the end of Romans chapter 16, verses 1, 3, and 6, he takes a moment to commend these particular spiritual giants. In fact, if you read through the rest of the chapter, he seems to commend them at a level that he doesn't with some of the guys that follow and others. So it's just... I don't know, just stupid to say that he was prejudiced and wasn't reflecting God's heart here or under the inspiration of the Spirit. And he was just impregnating Scripture with his own ridiculous notions and ideas that he was, in fact, chauvinistic. He was not. J. Mack wrote a church, and this is, a, this is on point. When I read this, I was like, that, that's going in there. It's too big for the bulletin, but it's going in somewhere. J. Mac says, a church may have some women who are better Bible students, better theologians, and better speakers than any of the men, <laughs> including the pastor. <laughs> and I was like, you know what? Yes, yes, yes. Better than the pastor? <laughs> come on. He literally says this. And it, to come from him, who's also been called chauvinistic, because he spent his entire life trying to keep the order of headship right. So he says there are women in churches that are just at a higher level than some of the men, undoubtedly. And he says, but if those women are obedient to God's order, they will submit to male leadership and will not try to usurp it simply because that is God's design. Listen to this. A wife, and I, hallelujah, amen, seen this, ready for a mic drop? 
A wife may be better educated, better taught in scripture, and more spiritually mature than her husband. Hmm? Oh, yeah. I've seen it. But because she is spiritual, she will willingly submit to him as the head of the family. Hmm. Just because you got a great arsenal of weapons doesn't mean you take over. <laughs> Christ gave you the weapons, now you're using them against your authority. This is what's going on in Corinth. Those weapons are to be used against the adversary, the devil, not your husband, not your pastors. Christ, husbands, men, wives, women. And third, Paul says the head of Christ is God. Mm. Jesus made clear that he had submitted himself to his Father's will, right? Over and over and over. John 4.34, John 5.30, John 6.38, 1 Corinthians 3.23, uh, 1 Corinthians 15.24-28. Uh, to 28. I mean, it's just threaded through his teachings that he had come not to serve himself but to serve the Father and to carry out the Father's will. Christ has, has never been um, before, during, or after his incarnation in any way inferior in essence to the Father. You need to understand that. But in his incarnation, he willingly submitted himself to the Father in his role as Savior and Redeemer he lovingly subjected himself completely to his Father's will as an act of humble obedience in fulfilling the plan of redemption. The point that Paul is seeking to make here through this clarification on headship, I think it's really simple. Here's the flow. Christ is submissive to his head, the Father. Husbands are submissive to their head, Christ. Wives are submissive to their head. Their husbands. That's what Paul is saying here in verse 3. This is the flow of headship in Christian homes and beyond. It is the order of spiritual or scriptural submission, right? Christ to the Father, man to Christ, wife to man, women to men. Now, this is not to say that Christian women do not submit to Christ directly. It is to say that if they are not yet married, they, uh, if they are in fact married, they submit to Christ through their husbands. If they are not yet married, they submit to Christ through their pastors, through male leadership, and through men in general in a sense, because that is the order. And perhaps they submit to him directly in a sense but this might indicate that they are not connected to a church body, which is an entirely different issue, right? I would just say, because this is the order that Paul is giving, I would just say that we as believers all submit to Christ. But I would just simply say to the marrieds that you're submitting to your husband. That's how you submit to Christ, to the married women. And if you're an unmarried woman, you submit to Christ on your own in a sense, but also through godly leadership, through men who lead, and through men whom God has appointed in various offices. That's, that's the order. It's really that simple. That's the flow. All right. Now let's move to the third point. Okay, we've got the commendation. We've got the what was that second one? We've got his clarification. He's reestablished for this church headship. You've got Christ, you've got man, you've got woman, and you've got the Father above all. And now we can get to really where he starts to correct, but I'm calling it Paul's contention. That's the third C. We see this in verses 4 to 5. Now listen to this. This is where we start to see the rebellion in the church. He says, every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. Okay. 
let, me, let me preface what I'm going to say. At the end of the day, we are not talking about head coverings. <laughs> Adventures in missing the point if you walk away from this, thinking that that's what you must wear now if you're a gal. We are talking about headship. We are talking about submission. That's the greater issue here. If you want to wear a head covering, fine. Paul is describing the particular issue at hand. In general terms, what he's saying is praying is talking to God about people, including ourselves, right? Sometimes we pray to God, we're talking about ourselves, our needs, things that are going on. So he talks about prayer, whether your head's covered or not. Prayer is talking to God about people, maybe about ourselves. And then he says prophecy. What is prophecy? It is talking to people about God. It's not telling the future prophesying in the Old Testament sense. Uh, in next Tuesday, you're going to have a burrito. It's going to wreck you. That's not a prophecy. You just know how I am, right? It's not future telling or anything like that. It is when, when I go to the Lord, I'm praying. When I tell Rick about Jesus, that's prophesying. I'm teaching him about Jesus. Prophesying in Scripture usually means teaching. So think like that. That's the example he's using, there was prayer and prophecy going on in this church. Praying to God, talking to God, and talking to others about God. That's what's going on. Think of it like this. Praying is vertical, man to God. Prophesying is horizontal, man to man. Both represent the primary dimensions of Christian ministry, right? We pray and we tell others about Jesus. That's our ministry. That's the Great Commission. When Paul said man dishonors his head while praying or prophesying with his head covered, he must have been referring to some kind of strange, bizarre Corinthian cultural deal, something that maybe Corinthian men were doing. It's not something that's a tradition or familiar to the church. Apparently, in some of their false religion, men would cover themselves as they prayed and you know, babbled on about Zeus or whatever. The phrase head covered literally means to hang down from the head. And that gives us the idea of a kind of veil or something. Like men would put a veil on and it would cover and hang down from the top of their head. The context implies that in Corinth, such a head covering, um, in some sense, maybe in the non-religious circles, but in any case, that some kind of a head covering like this, at least in the church, it would have been just completely ridiculous. This was, in a sense, without some of those religious extreme people in Corinth, apart from that, in the regular everyday society, and even in the church in a sense, we're talking about a men without hats society. I mean, they could dance if they want to. <laughs> they could even leave their cares behind, but, right? So it just, it wasn't really normal for a guy, that was a terrible joke. <laughs> But some of you got it because you're older um, and, you, and you know that stupid song, Robin's Laughing, because she's probably got it on her playlist. I'm just kidding. She doesn't. I have it on my playlist, and people love it when I play it. Isn't that weird? I just turned my headphones on with something else. So I don't have to hear it. Uh, but it's just bizarre. Like, Paul's bringing this up because it's very bizarre. People didn't, guys didn't wear hats or head coverings. And you might be thinking, well, I've seen Jewish people wearing head coverings. That really didn't come until about the 4th century A.D., by the way especially in religious customs, in Judaism. So they didn't start covering their heads till then, which is, according to Paul here, a disgrace. And so I think what's going on is that in this particular church, there were some men in this church, real brothers, they were worshiping God in a disgraceful manner by covering their heads during prayer and prophesying. prophesying. This is what they were doing. I don't know if they were getting it from the religious culture. I don't know where it was coming from. Probably the culture, although it was a men without, without hats. And because they were worshiping God in a disgraceful manner, they were obviously, as Paul says, dishonoring their, themselves firstly, I think, or maybe secondly, but obviously their head, which is Christ, right? Verse 3, we just learned that the head of man is Christ. And what Paul is saying now is that I don't know how I got into your church. I'm glad you're asking in your letter, but there's guys that are veiling themselves as they pray and prophesy and shouldn't be doing that. 
Okay, scripturally speaking, only women were required to wear head coverings. I just said scripturally speaking. Right now the women are going, oh Lord, maybe I need to go back to the bonnet. Anne's like, I'm not doing it. <laughs> He'd have been there, done that, bought the shirt. Okay, so some of the symbolism of the head covering. Okay, only if, if anyone's going to wear anything like this for prayer or prophecy or at all ever, it's, it's women that should be wearing them or would have been wearing them. Head coverings, in a way, were a sign or a symbol that affirmed the order of creation and symbolized a woman's submission to God, to her husband, and to men in general. That is the spiritual or scriptural significance of a head covering. If a woman wore one, she's saying, I'm submitted to God, I'm submitted to my husband if I have one. If I don't have one, I'm submitted to God and pastoral authority or whatever, or to men in general, I understand in the created order, I'm right here under men. That's what it symbolized. In Genesis 24, 64 to 65, we read about Rebecca who covered her head. She veiled herself when she was traveling to meet Isaac. Some say, oh, she was just doing that to be more alluring. Scripture describes her as a gorgeous woman. I don't think she needed to put something on to create mystery. All she had to do was show up and you're like, whoa! But she veiled herself. She covered her head. Uh, in Numbers 5.18, we read about wives that were suspected in committing adultery. They, you know, hey, I, you know, I know you've been messing around, sleeping around or whatever, and I haven't been. Okay, so to kind of try to prove it or not it, to clear them or to nail them, you know, get them busted, what they would do is a pre they would be, go before a priest and he would remove their head coverings and then make them take a vow of honesty. You swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth, the whole tr truth, so help you God, with the veil off. They had a veil when they went in. They had a covering when they went in. During Paul's day, if a Jewish woman ever uncovered her own hair in public, the law took this as evidence of her infidelity and permitted her husband to divorce her without ever having to pay any kind of alimony whatsoever. I'm talking about the significance and importance of head coverings. This is going to blow your mind. And you're going to say, why did we go away from them? It's a good question. The Mishnah, I don't know if you know what that is, written about 200 AD. It's the first written collection of the Jewish oral tradition. It says this, And who is considered a woman who violates the precepts of Jewish women? One who goes out with her head uncovered. Hmm. After the apostolic era, pretty much after 100 AD, some, a great many actually of the early church fathers supported and preached head coverings for Christian women. Hippolytus of Rome, around, around 170 AD to 235 AD, he said, let all the women have their heads covered. Hmm. Uh, this might be a surprise to you because it's not a subject that comes up when we talk about reform theology, but... Calvin, Luther, Wesley was a reformer, absolutely. A little different in his soteriology, but he was a reformer. Matthew, Henry, all supported head coverings. That's one of those truths that we kind of leave. Oh, they were Calvinists. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm, head coverings. Nah. I don't want to talk about that. Right? We don't want to talk about that. Now, this, this blew my mind because I... I was born in 69, so I don't, I, yeah, I just dated myself, but I was born in 69, so I don't really know, and I didn't do anything to try to establish this as reality, but there's a guy named Greg Gordon who wrote a really good blog on this stuff, and it seemed very good, but he said virtually all Christian women literally wore head coverings up to the early 1960s. Some of you uh, veteran saints might be able to affirm or Make me recall that later. <laughs> it's Greg Gordon, so I'm not going to do a thing with it. And he says that that is the point. 1960, that's when the sexual revolution came, and it makes sense. But that is the point when church culture began to shift away from head coverings for Christian women. It's hard for me to believe that prior to 1960, most Christian women wore head coverings. I wasn't around for that. I don't have much pictures of that that I can look at, but it's hard for me to believe. But I don't want to just dismiss it. Could be true. Amen. 
Yeah, could be with the Roman Catholic gals. Okay, this, historically speaking, is a long-held tradition up to the 20th century. I think that's a fact, okay? And that's not even my point. I'm not even trying to say, okay, let's go back to the head coverings. I'm not trying to say that at all because that's adventures and missing the point here. To put this as simply as I know how, this is my point. When those Christian men put on head coverings to pray and prophesy, they were doing what only women do and therefore acting like women. That's what we're dealing with here. And that is why it was dishonoring. Men are to act like men. And today our culture doesn't even know what a man is. When men act like women, it is disgraceful, and I say it is dangerous because that is an attack on God and his created order. Later in 1 Corinthians, listen to this, how this ties together. Later in the same epistle, in chapter 16, verse 13, Paul tells the exact same group of Christian brothers and sisters, primarily here on the Christian brothers right now in this context, he says this, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Why is he saying in chapter 16, act like men? Because right here they're acting like women. <coughs> hmm. and, and, and to add insult to injury here, there were also women in the Corinthian church, which is really the focus of the text, who were worshiping God in a disgraceful manner by removing their head coverings during prayer and prophesying. That's really what he's focused on here. And what were they doing in this act? They were acting like men who do not normally wear head coverings. And they were also acting like the pagan women around them who basically never wore head coverings. Corinthian women did not wear head coverings. In Greco-Roman society, I don't know if you knew this or not, I found it fascinating, but a woman's hair came to represent her beauty, her sexuality, and her availability. If a woman was walking down the street with long, flowing, beautiful hair, she was saying, come get me. Now think about the implication with women doing this in the church. Hmm. Okay, the temple prostitutes who were prevalent in this time, they wore long, shiny, beautiful, flowing hair. Why? To entice potential clients. Baldness, by the way, was detestable. A woman without hair was seen as accursed. First century feminists, because they were around, they liked to stick it to the man. How? By shaving their heads and by marching around topless. You thought it was bad today. It was pretty bad in Greco-Roman culture. And here's the deal. Christian women did not want to send the wrong, wrong signals to men by having their hair down. They covered it. By wearing it down, they're saying, I'm sexually active, I'm available. They didn't want to be associated with anything like that. They wanted to honor Christ, so they wore the head coverings. <laughs> and when some of the ladies in this church cast off their head coverings, they were acting like men who normally don't wear such things, and they were acting like the immoral pagan women of Corinth. You see what's happening here? They were dishonoring themselves and their head, their husbands or pastors, obviously Christ. And they were dishonoring men in general because of the created order. Head coverings were so important at that time that if a gal prayed and prophesied without it, Paul says that was as if her head had been shaven, which is disgrace. Do we now understand why Sinead O'Connor was so controversial when she first appeared in the late 80s and early 90s as a musical artist with her shaven head. Do you remember this? She wasn't just a, a talent, she's a beautiful singer. 
just not just a talented singer. She deliberately shaved her head because she hated the biblical patriarchy. She hated headship. She said this. I just read a set of statements by her. This was not, she was not a cancer survivor or struggling through something that should have elicited compassion and acceptance because sometimes women go bald and they can't help it. That is, we're not talking about that here. She deliberately, like a first century feminist, shaved her dome. And now we can understand the significance of her. Because I always wondered, what is so great about her? Oh, she shaved off her head on purpose because she hates the word. Okay, now I get it. But really what you have playing out here, the real issue in the Corinthian church wasn't head coverings. It was role reversal. It was the dismissing of the biblical order and headship. That's what's going on here. J. Mac again, he says, and listen to this carefully. As with meat offered to idols, did we not just labor that point for days? As with meat offered to idols, there was nothing in the wearing or not wearing of the head covering itself that was right or wrong. It is the rebellion against God-ordained roles that is wrong. You boil it down, the men were behaving like women and the women were behaving like men. Neither were supporting or were submitting to God and his created order. They were, this term came out in the 80s, they were gender bending. Today they're gender breaking. Headship was reversed, it was backwards. And for this reason among many, this is why the Roman Empire was ultimately in the end destroyed and why America is headed toward destruction. Once the God-ordained genders and roles go, it's only a matter of time before everything implodes. A backwards society is not sustainable. Anything that goes against the way God created it to be cannot be sustained for long. History makes this so clear. America can't even just pause what it's doing in all of its justice and virtue signaling and wokeness and nonsense and crap. It can't just stop and say, hey, let's just take a quick look at the Roman Empire. No, it won't. And that truth will come true. Those who fail to learn from history shall repeat it. We also very sadly see this kind of backwardness in churches, right? Women elders, women pastors, women preachers, women this, women that. It's everywhere. God calls godly, qualified men to these offices, not women. 1 Tim 3, 1 to 7, and of course Titus 1, 5 to 9 lays out the qualifications for an overseer. The first thing that's stated is that he must be the husband of one wife. I just, I don't think that means what it says. It's everywhere. A church, listen to this, a church that appoints women elders women's as elders and pastors and preachers it's got the roles backwards it's dishonoring its ultimate head christ and ultimate ultimate head the father i've often wondered if when we see women in these kinds of leadership roles if it's actually an act of judgment of god of, from god against these churches i wonder if it is because in Isaiah 3.12, it says that as a judgment to Israel, they will be given women leaders. And you say, well, that sounds rather insulting. Well, the idea there is that what are women called in Scripture? The weaker vessel. That's what they're called. And they are the weaker vessel. Physically, they're supposed to be. Heaven forbid today they but as weaker vessels, the idea there, right? That's 1 Peter 3, 7, by the way. As weaker vessels, in that particular context in Isaiah, as weaker vessels, they were not able to fend off attackers. And so if you're given women leadership, that means you're going to be rolled over by Nebuchadnezzar or somebody else. That's the idea. So it makes me wonder if this is actually, oh, everyone's praising God and so thrilled about this new women pastor. I think it's a judgment against a wicked people that will not live out the Bible. 
women are weaker vessels. We need to come to terms with that. They're not weaker spiritually. Sometimes they're stronger spiritually. I'd say almost always. But they're weaker in the flesh and in their physical strength and in other ways. They're very emotional. You guys are very emotional. Men are, what's an emotion? Is that a new candy bar? We're dumb. You're just wired different, and you're supposed to be. Okay. Why are transsexual men entering women's sports today? They say it's about inclusion. They say it's about equality. This is what we're being told. These are the lies that are being spewed. It doesn't have anything to do with that. I'll tell you why. It's because they know they are stronger and that they can beat women. That's why. They competed in men's sports and got smoked. Okay, I don't like this. I'm going to pretend to be a woman. I'm going to become a nationally recognized swimmer. And that nationally recognized swimmer blew all the women to pieces. Why? Man! They do it because they know women are weaker vessels and they take advantage of them. What makes me sick is that society's praising this. We're living in Stoopsville. It's shameful. And we can add to this, a church that appoints homosexual men and women to the same offices is an absolute abomination because it is distorting gender, sexuality, the created order, the roles of men and women. This is a, a massive assault on God. The pervasiveness of such things has not only desensitized a great many Christians, there's just so much of it now, Christians are like, I think it's normal. It's even led some astray. Some men and women that I've even known in the past have just jumped on board with all this nonsense. Hitler once said, if you repeat a lie enough, people will eventually believe it as a truth. And that's what we see. We're being told something over and over and over. Now we're starting to go, I think it's normal. They're using Hitler's tactic on us. Okay, let me just say this as we're beginning to wrap up here. How should we respond to what we're seeing going on around us? How should we respond even to this message, in a sense, about headship and about submission? The first thing we must do is repent if we are part of the problem and start practicing biblical headship and submission in our homes, in our churches, in our community. That's the first step. We're not getting anywhere until we humble ourselves and recognize this and take up our God-created and ordained roles. I have to lead. My wife has to submit. And I make it a lot easier for her to submit when I lead well. I make it hard for her when I'm a bonehead. Six days of the week, bonehead one day of the week, I'll submit. No, I'm just kidding. But I mean, you got it, you got it. Well, the first thing we got to do is live this. Get the roles right in your own houses. Honor Christ by letting men lead. Honor Christ by acknowledging them as men. Letting them lead and helping them lead. The second thing we must do is recognize all of the stuff that we see as a satanic attack against the church and start praying like crazy like never before, because that's what it is. It's not just an attack on American society, it's an attack on the church. And the third thing we must do is share the truth in love. The gospel, it really does change everything. It washes away all our sins. It wraps us in the righteousness of Christ. It removes, you know, all divine condemnation. Thank God for that. It makes us new creations. 1 Peter 2.24, 2 Corinthians 5.21, Romans 8.1, 2 Corinthians 5.17. I could go on and on and on about the glories of this salvation and grace what the gospel does. It raises spiritually dead sinners to spiritual life and makes them saints in Christ. Ephesians 2, 1 to 6. We could go on and on and on. It transforms worldly men and women into Christian men and women. It makes hardened rebels meek and submissive to the biblical order. This is what the us. You say to yourself, look at what's going on around us. They're destroying the roles. They're destroying 
gender. They're destroying everything before my eyes. I've been around since 1969. I never thought I'd see the things that I'm seeing today. And I don't think I could have seen them prior to knowing Christ. I can see them now because I have eyes to see them. And we say to ourselves, there's never even been anything like this in America. Well, there was all of this in a bag of chips in the Roman Empire a long time ago. But we say to ourselves, I just don't even know what to do with this. I don't know what to do with this. I don't think there's any hope. I don't know what to do. Gospel, gospel, gospel. Preach the gospel. It transforms transgender to back to gender. And it's not improvement. It's a new life. We preach the gospel because there is power in the gospel to change the most dreadful sinner into a saint. It is what puts an end to these shenanigans. And if people hate us for sharing the truth and love, so be it. Receive their scorn as a badge of honor and rejoice like Peter and John did after getting slammed and beaten at the Sanhedrin for sticking up for Christ. Acts 5.41. And guess what? They don't want to hear it from you. They lash out at you. Take it as a badge of honor. Shake the dust off your feet and keep moving forward toward the prize. And maybe you can make your way back around to those people by God's grace. That's the antidote to this craziness.